What a crowd. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Frank Cassaniti, financial advisor at, uh, with Bernstein. And on behalf of the firm, we are honored to be partnering with Need Global to host this special UN Week event. And we're thankful for the opportunity to bring together so many amazing organizations from around the world to collaborate under one roof. Before kicking off the program, a quick word about our firm. We are Bernstein Private Wealth Management, and we advise high net worth clients on the complexities that come with wealth. We have a singular focus on research and investment management, and we devote 100% of our resources to delivering the best outcomes for our clients. The advice we provide is driven by best-in-class research that goes beyond investments and into areas of planning, which often prove far more impactful for our clients than the returns on their investments alone. And for investors seeking to align their portfolios with their values, Bernstein has constructed a suite of innovative ESG and purpose-driven portfolios in both public and private markets with demonstrated track records of success that support the notion that you don't have to sacrifice return in order to do good with your money. For anyone interested in learning more about Bernstein's planning capabilities, or if you'd like to discuss the creative ways in which we invest to better the planet, I'll be available following the program, and I look forward to speaking. And I'll pass it off to Ina with Need Global. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ina Brewer. I'm the executive director of Need Global. We are a national network of private family foundation and individual networks across the country. And it is my pleasure to just start by thanking Alliance Bernstein for this beautiful space. I hope everybody will take a moment to just stare out the window and breathe for a second before you leave. Um, and also to thank all the organizers of this event. Thank you to Adesso, to Wings, to Council on Foundations, and to the Hilton Foundation for making this possible. We've been talking about this for a while. And also to thank all of you for coming here today. Um, I see we have a real diversity of people in the audience. I think we've all been hopping from event to event, and it's a slightly different mix today. Um, and we have, you know, individual donors, family foundations, larger foundations, the room, government representatives, representatives from the global south, as well as from civil society organizations. So we're here gathered today to consider how all of us can help contribute to creating the enabling environment for community-based development um, and how to shift power. I think we all know that this is not a new conversation. This has been going on for a while, but it does feel like we're in a different moment where perhaps we can actually shift, shift systems, shift mindsets and shift norms and create the environment that's needed. And I think we also have to understand that our role of, as philanthropists is not to lead, but to help create this environment. So with this, I will hand the floor over to Benjamin Belagy. Thank you from Wings. Thank you so much for welcoming us here. Thank you, Ina, and thank you all for coming to this uh, event. Uh, we're really glad to partner with uh, ADESO uh, and uh, Council on Foundations, uh, NEED, uh, as well as the Hilton Foundation. Uh, and thanks again to Heinz Bernstein for, for having us uh, in this incredible uh, place. Um, so this is a great moment for us. This is important that we continue to deepen the conversation on localization. Uh, and also look at different dimensions of this uh, aid localization question. Um, I am the executive director of WINGS. Uh, as some of you may know, WINGS is a global network of uh, 210 philanthropic support organizations, networks, and funders who are developing uh, the sector around the world, trying to make philanthropy stronger, to grow the pie, but also to make these resources more impactful, more transformative for society. Uh, and localization for us is something very central, very important, uh, because we believe that there will not be uh, a real shift in the way uh, uh, development and solidarity happens if we don't walk the talk on localization and if we don't look at not only the question of getting international resources to local actors, which obviously is critical 
is difficult but can be done with the right strategies and with the right uh, uh, with the right tools uh, and the right mindsets and values. Um, but also thinking about how we can localize resources, local resources for local development, not just international resources getting to local actors. And this too is possible, and it's possible by investing in local networks, local infrastructure for civil society, for philanthropy, for giving uh, in emerging markets where there's a huge potential, but it's untapped because there's a, a critical lack of investment and there are enabling environment uh, issues, there are policies and regulations that hinder uh, the growth of uh, philanthropy uh, and uh, and its, its, its capacity to contribute to the SDGs and to the development agenda. Um, so today we're going to have a great panel discussions with the distinguished panelists, uh, Michel Sumilas, who is the assistant to the administrator of the Bureau for Policy Planning and Learning at USAID, uh, Digen Ali, the executive director uh, of the civil society development organization ADESO, Peter Logan, who is the CEO uh, of the Conran Hilton Foundation, Sarah Aviel, the president and CEO of the Inter-American Foundation, and uh, Shen uh, Makofen, board chair and president of the Avina Foundation. Uh, and we will have closing remarks from uh, Rose Maruru sitting here, uh, who is uh, going to join us at the end to uh, share her perspective. She's the CEO of Epic Africa and the co-chair of the Enabling Environment Working Group of WINGS. And we will also hear uh, some words from Natalie Ross, uh, uh, VP uh, for International at the Council on Foundations. Um, before uh, we start the conversation with our panelists, we're going to listen to a video message that was uh, recorded by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights uh, uh, to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and of Association, Clément Voul. Uh, just published in July 2023, 20, uh, the UN Principles and Guidelines for Civil Society's Access to Resources. These guidelines also give practical recommendations and positive examples about creating an enabling environment for civil society's right to access to the funding for their work. Uh, WINGS sees these guidelines as a milestone to all funders on how to promote, invest, and support uh, 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 local civil society and localization. So I'll Pause here, and I think we should have the video starting. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are joining us from. <laughs> I would like to thank Wings for inviting me to participate in this important event. Sorry to not be able to be with you uh, because of uh, prior commitments in particular my current visit in Algeria. I would like to say that in June this year, I presented to the Human Rights Council a set of guidelines to help UN member states and donor agencies address global challenge affecting civil society ability to access resources. These guidelines seek to further assist states, the international donor community and other key stakeholders such as banks and financial institutions in implementing the recommendation of my June 2022 report, which address global trends and challenges threaten civil society access to resources, including access to foreign funding. My mandate has documented an increased control of an undue restriction on the access to resources by civil society organizations. I have observed an increased number of restrictive injury law, which subjects civil society to burdensome oversight regime and disproportionate sanction. The consequences for local civil society organization have been particularly dire. And I would like to give example here of Zimbabwe PVO amendment bill, which is currently pending for enactment. Another defining trend in restricting foreign funding is the stigmatization of association. For years now, some governments have deliberately de depicted foreign donor funding as a form of imperialism or neocolonialism and subjected civil society recipients to legal restriction and stigmatization. We can also give here example of the law on non-commercial organization in Kedisa, which also my mandate have to make some observation. Civil society are also being labeled as anti-development 
and classified on political motivated ground as being affiliated with terrorist group. Here also we can talk about the example of the six Palestinian NGOs that was declared by the Israeli government as terrorist organization. These measures have often been deliberately used to silence, intimidate, and harass human rights organizations and those working for accountability. As a result, many civil society organizations have been forced to reduce their operation, readjust their activity, or close down. Let me introduce some key recommendations of my guideline. The first state must respect the inherent nature of the right to access resources as part of the right to freedom of association. As such, states must respect, protect, and facilitate association right to freely seek, receive, and use foreign funding and promote cross-border philanthropy. Any law and regulation that's unfair, targeted, or restricts the international flow of donation must be repealed or amended in line with international human rights norms. States should prioritize creating an enabled environment for civil society, including by lifting restrictions, prevent, preventing civil society from accessing resources, and otherwise acting as a full partner in locally-led development efforts. Moreover, states should prevent and protect associations from being subject to stigmatization, harassment, threat, and attack, including on the basis of the source of their funding. As an important measure, states should develop a positive narrative around philanthropy as a strategic part of the economy and the achievements of sustainable development, as well as the protection and promotion of human rights. State must also ensure equitable rules governing access to resources, both by the corporation and civil society sector. This including refraining from imposing administrative burden or fees on organizations to mobilize international resources and seek, receive, and use foreign funding while it's not imposing this on corporation as we have seen in many countries. Furthermore, providing tax incentive for donation to civil society organization convey an important message. It passes the message that the government recognizes the role of association in addressing societal need, helping overcome the stigmatization surrounding civil society organization. Among other measures, in relation to the donor, Donors should proactively seek opportunity to consult with local civil society regarding, regarding obstacles to civil society operation and other factor concerning locally led development. They should address these obstacles and factor not only in their own development policy and program, but by raising this issue as appropriate in dialogue with partner governments. In relation to the civil society, the, the guideline also emphasized that civil society should encourage the establishment of voluntary civil society self-regulation mechanism in order to promote accountability and transparency. This will help to show government, but also to counter narrative of the governments that civil society doesn't want transparency. And civil society also should invest in capacity building initiative to ensure that local civil society can lead on development, cooperation, and humanitarian assistance efforts. I also emphasize in this guideline that the international community also have a crucial role to play in fostering an environment that involves civil society and enables them to freely assess the resources necessary to their work while upholding these rights. Let me conclude here for the lack of time by saying that my sincere hope is that this guideline will serve as a basis for a renewed commitment and partnership 
between states, donor, banks, multilateral institutions, and civil society to effectively address existing challenge and overcome restricting restriction imposed to access to resources by civil society, by enabling civil society to receive funding, including foreign funding. This will also help civil society to effectively contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goal. I thank you for this opportunity and I wish you a successful deliberation. You hear me? Yeah, it's back. All right. You and the rapporteur could not be with us in present, but it definitely deserves uh, some uh, recognition and applause from us because I think uh, the content of these guidelines is extremely important uh, for both localization, uh, democracy, uh, and, uh, and simply uh, thriving civil societies around the world. Resourcing is key, obviously, uh, and I think we have not been intentional enough about facilitating an environment that enables local resourcing and international resourcing for, for these uh, or CS organizations and, and civil society. So uh, I will start the, with the first question uh, to Michel Sumiles. Uh, so Michel, what, what do you think about these UN guidelines? How do you think they open up new opportunities uh, for civil society and what is the importance of this enabling environment uh, to grow, to grow and support uh, civil society. Well, first of all, um, let me just start by thanking Wings and um, everyone on the panel here for everything you've been doing. I think this might be the second or third year that we've actually been doing an event with Wings and talking about these issues. And, and everyone here has been a true leader. Um, I think um, what I would say is a couple of things. We're um, USAID has always been a supporter and has tried to work with local partners in various different ways. Um, we have, with the um, leadership of Administrator Power, really taken this, we think, to mm -hmm. the next level. And we've been trying to really think about how are we impacting that enabling environment? What are we doing that's not making it possible? Um, and trying to actually change our behavior so that we actually um, engage with local civil society in new and different ways. Um, so let me just uh, say that we really applaud, actually, the UN for putting out this statement. We think this is really important and that the message does need to get to local governments and national governments, um, that funding local civil society does not mean that we're actually, um, that we're not supportive of local governments and national governments, but that it is an ecosystem that we all need to be creating that, we, that leads to uh, greater uh, development outcomes. Um, in terms of what we, how we see this issue, you know, we, um, we feel like our we need to do internal change. We need to change the way we work. We need to change the way USAID shows up at the table in a country, whether that is how we engage with um, local partners, how we co-create projects, how we co-create goals and outcomes. Um, and we are working very uh, thoughtfully on that internally. The other thing that we're working on is actually really just um, holding ourselves accountable to this um, to this goal. So we have two metrics, one that 25% of our resources will go to local organizations and that 50% of our resources will be implemented in a way that is more conducive to local ownership and local and the shifting of power. Um, I'm, I am excited, but also a bit embarrassed to say that we have only gone to 10% um, in the last year, but that does represent an increase of $623 million. Um, in one year going to go, going to and through local organizations. I'm going to say that one of the um, other things that we're doing is working internally to remind our Foreign Service staff of the importance of working closely with our Foreign Service national staff. 75% um, of our staff in our missions around the world are actually from the countries where we're working. And so we're really working on creating a power shift within missions, a power shift with our partners, um, and we wish it was going faster. Um, and I'm sure our partners wish that it was going faster. Um, and we will be working on that in the next year. Finally, I'll just say we have released a new policy on local capacity strengthening, and we have a summit on October 10th and 11th, where we're inviting local civil society from around the world and um, all of our partners to uh, share with us what's working and what's not working. How can we work differently? What should we do differently? What kind of new awards? What kind of new environments? What kind of new 
coalitions, networks should we be supporting in country? So I'll close there and just say, I look forward to um, being here with all of my colleagues and uh, hearing the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. And uh, turning now to, to Digan, uh, Ali, and Digan, we, we'd love to hear your perspective. You, you've been a, a very, of course, prominent vocal leader uh, in, in calling for more localization. You were with us last year at the Ford Foundation to, to share your messages with the philanthropy field. Um, so it would be great to hear what you think will allow to start really walking the talk. I think we've been talking a lot about localization in the past few years, including now in the philanthropy sector. Uh, and what do you think are uh, the, uh, the elements that will make it possible for all these foundations and international funders to really uh, you know, direct their funding to local actors? What, what are the, the, the critical elements for that to happen? Um, thank you, Ben. Um... I think, first of all, I, I think we need to acknowledge that um, changing uh, government institutions like USAID is not an easy task. And we applaud Samantha Power and her team for trying to make um, the impossible possible. <laughs> um, it's, it's an uphill battle. And, um, but this is why philanthropy I think is so critical in this uh, ecosystem to de-risk new ideas and new infrastructure and to show proof of concept to the bilaterals so that later it's easier for them to buy into it. Um, and so for us, what we have said is, okay, great. Thank you, Samantha Power for reviving the 25% target that was almost dying. Um, it's a 26, well, it's, I think it's uh, from other bilaterals, in my opinion, the grand bargain target has not been met. And, um, and uh, so it needed to be resuscitated and she's done that. And I hope that other government donors are taking the lead uh, from her. Um, now on the philanthropy and the in, what I think is missing is the architecture to move money more approximately. And um, we've heard all types of barriers over the years as an organization. So as organizations from the global south, one of the first barriers was the fact that we didn't even have an advocacy um, uh, uh, group uh, pulpit. And so uh, the Americans have interactions, the British have bond, but we didn't have anything for ourselves. So that's when we founded the NEAR network. Um, it's a global civil society network. So we incubated them and now um, I'm happy to say we're just a fiscal sponsor and they're very independent from us and soon they'll spin off. So, so there was an advocacy need. Um, now we've said, okay, what are the barriers that donors have to moving money? And one of that barrier is visibility and access to organizations on the ground. Um, I can guarantee you the Kenya mission of USAID has the same problem that they talk to the same 10, 15 Kenyan NGOs and the big ones. They don't really know who's out in Isiolo doing very, very local work um, or Turkana or any of these um, very vulnerable communities. And so how do we make those organizations visible to um, donors, whether they're in Kenya or whether they're in LA? And, um, and the, so we are trying to develop an online platform like LinkedIn for local organizations to upload their profile and to be made visible. Um, and it's called Kujalink and with the support of the Hilton team and Gates, we're hoping to get it off the ground next year. Um, we're in the soft launch stage of that and we have about a thousand users. So my appeal to you, please, is to get your partners on the platform, number one, and for you and your program officers to get on the platform. And so let me know um, uh, offline and we can talk about that. Um, the second thing that we've noticed is the other infrastructure need is, so Samantha Power wants to move 25%. Most local organizations can't meet the due diligence requirements of local uh, of most of these donors. So how do we actually um, uh, make them more compliant? And to do that, we're developing a private company where organizations can outsource their back office, particularly the non-compliant areas around HR, finance, procurement that are so, so difficult for these local organizations. So I'll just leave it there for now, but um, in the future, maybe I can talk about another infrastructure idea. We are not out of ideas as the Global South. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what we are at, what we have a hard time with is the resourcing of those ideas. So um, what we need to, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we need to stop the rhetoric and actually make real investment in infrastructure. So great message. Thank you so much again. Yes. 
So it will be great now to, to hear from, from Peter Logger, the CEO of the Hilton Foundation. You, we heard that you're involved in supporting Kujaling. You're working with WINGS members in East Africa and West Africa to help build a stronger ecosystem for local philanthropy, among many other interventions. So it would be great to hear from you how you see the role of an international global foundation like the Hilton Foundation in helping to address these barriers uh, that, that uh, Deegan was, was talking about and create a stronger enabling environment and infrastructure. Super, well, I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot to do. I think Deegan uh, and Michelle outlined a lot of it. Um, I my main message to folks is come on in, the water's warm. This is not <laughs> as difficult as people tell themselves. And sometimes I think people tell themselves it's difficult because that is an excuse for not doing things that you can fairly straightforwardly do. But before going into that, I just wanna say how um, lucky and honored I feel to be following both Michelle and Dagon here, because I think they, they both represent efforts that are common sense, but breathtakingly exciting at the same time. Mm. Uh, you know, I think USAID, what the leadership role that they have played is a treasure to those of the audience who are American, you should feel very proud and you should also feel called upon to support it because uh, it's an important effort, uh, but it's a challenging one as, as Michelle outlined. Uh, outlined. I, I would encourage you to go on the web and look at, um, just uh, type in a uh, donor statement on locally led development. And you'll see a statement that's been signed by 19 bilaterals with USAID and Norway in the lead that is very cool and that gives Dagon a whole lot of stuff to work with mm -hmm. in terms of shifting power and not just funding flows, but partnership and strategy design. So I think USID has made themselves vulnerable, uh, taken a, a great step and we can all help them go over the finish line, not only in the funding flows question, but also I think, and more importantly in that partnership question a good donorship. Um, and, Dagon, I can't say too much about all the creative ideas you and others have had that are fairly straightforward to support. Now, what can an organization like ours do? Well, we can meddle in a lot of sauces, right? Um, we can, uh, an independent funder can speak to the heads of multilaterals. I've been speaking this week to the heads of UNICEF, the World Bank, et cetera, about the importance of locally led development. We can put wind under the wings of bilaterals and say this would be a good way to go. If they say, mm, we're only at 10% and it's hard, we'll say, well, we were at 5% a few years ago and we're at 25 now. And it really is, as USAID is doing, it's a whole of organization commitment. In your program side, you look just as Dagan has said, mm -hmm. at sourcing, how do you know who's out there? How do they know you? You look at diligence. How do you make it simple for you to have confidence that someone nine time zones away is doing good work but how do you make it simple for them to apply? Uh, how do you look at monitoring and evaluation without making it a fetish, but making it just into what you need to know, what you need to learn. And a lot of our modern evaluation should be focused on us and how we learn to do this work better. Right? Uh, so I, I think there's a, a ton of stuff to do. I would say there's also, you know, if, again, to take a US perspective, because I'm, I'm loath to talk about the internal politics and regulation of other countries, although Benjamin may, may press me to do that. Uh, but in the US, we are regulated by the IRS. The IRS sets up very small barriers called equivalency determination that most of us never have the courage to cross. We have to determine that local NGOs are the equivalent of 501c3s here. It's actually pretty simple, right? And uh, I, I think we should really, really work on that, learn how to do it, those of you who are brave can also do expenditure responsibility where if funding is used non-charitably, you're on the hook, but there may be organizations you think are so good that you're willing to take that risk and I would encourage you in that direction. And one thing that I would really give a shout out to the Council on Foundations who's here, 15 years ago, they and the European Foundations, well, and a number of US organizations, I should say, uh, talked with, started talking with the IRS and said, you know, it is kind of silly for each foundation to have to do its own due diligence on, on organizations. So we have 10 different foundations asking the same local organization, the same questions. And IRS is not a fast moving organization, but they did say, yes, this is logical. 
And uh, they allowed the setup of the NGO repository and, and the work of TechSoup, which means that we can all use one another's diligence. Now let's, you know, uh, Dagon's ideas go in that, in that direction, but taking it beyond just US regulation. And, and let's think about that. Let's talk to our authorities about what makes sense. And let's, let's really work on that. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter, uh, for highlighting all these uh, possible approaches. And thank you for supporting that. Uh, indeed, there's a, a leverage of influence uh, that is, is, is it's really beyond dollars and, and money, which of course are also needed to support initiatives like the one Digan was talking about. But then there's also the access and the influence that foundations have and that really can be leveraged to, to, to create a more enabling environment uh, for international cross-border giving and for domestic philanthropy. Uh, now, uh, we're going to speak with you, Sarah. Uh, you're, you're leading the Inter-American Foundation, which is a foundation, but it's a governmental organization. And uh, we, we would love to hear more about your vision of localization, how you try to contribute to this agenda and, and how you see these, these questions around building the ecosystem, building the environment, how does that connect to, to your efforts to, towards localization? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. And yes, the Inter-American Foundation is a US government agency and it was created by Congress 50 some years ago uh, to provide support directly to communities. And so even, you know, we often think about the US government or Congress as being risk averse, um, but we were a pioneer of localization uh, even before it was part of the discourse. And we are 100% localized. We have 400 current grantees in 27 countries that um, are uh, adding on to almost 6,000 uh, civil society organizations that we've supported in the region. Um, you know, a couple of things, just picking up on, on my colleagues. Um, uh, when I came in, I, you know, a lot of our focus has been on the support we give to our grantees and civil society organizations, but I've increasingly realized that there's a huge role for us to play in support to our philanthropic partners as, as well, and you know, have worked with USAID as well as private donors on being the sourcing of civil society organizations and doing that due diligence. We, um, although we are predominantly funded by Congress and, and US government appropriations, we do have gift authority and can accept uh, donations and partnerships. We have several philanthropic and corporate partnerships. It's tax deductible, can help you with the IRS piece of it. And it's an effective platform for being able to use our due diligence and vetting and oversight. We work with, with uh, embassies and missions to be able to do that, as well as provide visibility and access. We've heard from many of our philanthropic partners like the Mott Foundation and Tinker that they don't have the reach that we do. We have field staff throughout the region. We have the, the reach of the US government. And so we can be an effective partner in that. Um, in terms of the localization discourse, another piece is you know, where this bridge between local civil society and the US government is making sure that the localization discourse does not just happen sort of separate in the development implementation realm, but that when we're having policy discussions on climate or migration or whatever it is, we're thinking about the fact that investing in local organizations is an underutilized tool to be able to make a difference on these big challenges. I think so often policymakers like to focus understandably on the big scale, the sustainable solutions, and want sort of a silver bullet at times. And recognizing that, yes, we need, we need scalable solutions, but you can scale in different ways. And investing in, in local civil society organizations is an effective way of doing that. Um, our organizations are you know, on the front lines of these challenges and, and address them in, in multi-dimensional ways and, and, um, and can be an effective, effective way. So it's not just about the localization discourse, but bringing localization to, to the policy discourse. I'll, I'll leave it there, but happy to come back to them. Thanks so much, Sarah, for bringing these important dimensions of the influence on policies and not just sort of at the project level, which I think we're still very much stuck in this project industry. Uh, and, and it's really about, about thinking about this uh, in, you know, voice of local actors in, in how we shape policy. Uh, so thanks for, for bringing that. And in terms of scaling, indeed, 
not just about scaling up, but also scaling out and, and creating the sort of multiplier effect. Uh, again, with this uh, strong infrastructure and ecosystem that can that can play that role on the ground. Wonderful. And um, so my question now is uh, for for Sean uh, with with the Avina Foundation. So at, at Avina, you're you're playing this sort of broker role, right, between international donors, local communities, and and different partners. And uh, so it would be great to hear more about this approach to to be a broker of relationships and how that contributes to localization. Uh, and also maybe some of the challenges or opportunities that you see in terms of engaging with such a diversity of actors on the ground and and, and how does that look like uh, at Avina? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I mean, Avina works for systemic change. And uh, what we've learned over the past three decades is that that requires building a vi very diverse social capital around a change agenda which is difficult. Um, it means that you have to have people at the table that don't wanna be there with somebody else. It means that you have to have sectors at the table that maybe do, usually don't get involved in these kinds of change processes. Um, we work with business, we work with government, local government, regional government, national government, international organizations, because we realize that it's only by putting all those people in the same room that you can uh, really make a difference. And we try to go, we, we work in um, 15 different countries in Latin America, from Mexico down to Argentina. We have legal entities in all those countries, which allows us to uh, adapt um, and to have agility in the way that we fund these different processes. Because sometimes you don't need a million dollar grant, you need $50,000 tomorrow to get something done or to pay for plane tickets for everybody to be at the right meeting. And that kind of agility is what we are able to provide. Um, the diversity question is, uh, is const a constant challenge. Um, and a lot of organizations want to uh, steer away from that. Uh, we say that if it's not uncomfortable in the room, it's you're probably not going to get anything done. Uh, you need to have uncomfortable. You need to be talking to people that you don't want to talk to to actually make the change happen. We get very comfortable talking to the same people that all think like us, um, and so Avina has really specialized in brokering those those situations um, and making sure. I mean, the diversity at the table is really part of the change itself and uh, especially empowering local communities to be sitting at the same table with the companies and the government organizations that make the decisions that affect their lives. That is really key and that is part of the change because once they're talking directly, and it's never, there's always a power asymmetry that you have to be aware of, but at least if they're able to talk directly to the people responsible for making the decisions, then that automatically alters a little bit the situation. And we've seen this happen, uh, for example, with uh, recycling communities in Latin America, which are, they pick up you know, uh, uh, scraps on the street, um, they form cooperatives. Um, they're lots of times treated as second-class citizens, uh, but they're organized. They're actually doing an economic uh, job that, that benefits society. So how do you get them at the same table with Alcoa or with the uh, Coca-Cola whose cans they're picking up? to show that what they're doing has value for the company, for the country, and maybe we can change policy so that this actually, the policy actually it strengthens these co-ops and gives them a place in the value chain. So we look for those types of opportunities, um, but you can't find those opportunities if you don't have a diverse social capital that you're working with. So my last comment would be just, um, when we think about these changes and, and these focuses to think about putting a little bit more resources and effort into patiently building the social capital, the diverse social capital. It's not wasted money. It's actually uh, the best investment you can make if you want systemic change. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. More like transversal investments in, you know, building in, in this case the sort of partnership environment, the partnership infrastructure is usually overlooked or seen as something as a waste of money when there are so many urgent needs around. But mm -hmm. as you're saying, this is one of the most, if not the most effective way to really create uh, uh, systemic change and, and systemic impact. So th thanks for bringing this 
Um, so um, we'll, we'll start another round of questions. Uh, so uh, back to you, Michel, uh, on um, maybe telling us a little bit more about the, again, you know, this, so you have this 25% commitment, you are 10%. Uh, of course, one of the, of the probably barriers or issues you need to, to grapple with is around your accountability as a, uh, as a, as a public organization. And, and uh, so how do you try to, to balance this need for accountability uh, with uh, the, the, the need to, to get these resources on the ground to small organizations that don't have the capacity. Um, if you can tell us a little bit more about, about that, that question and how you're progressing. So thanks for the question. This is actually a really fascinating panel, so I really appreciate it. A couple things I would say um, in terms of, you know, um, I think we actually, um, I hope there's not a recorder going on, but I think we, uh, there is. I'm going to say that I think as a U.S. government, we often hide behind the accountability uh, excuse. We can't do this because we need, we have these accountability measures. It is very true that we as a U.S. government have to make sure that U.S. resources given to us by the U.S. taxpayer are used well. But that does not mean that we have to ask local organizations to jump through a thousand different hoops and fill out the exact same paperwork that an INGO uh, is, is doing. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do within the agency is really try to assess um, how we are interacting and what we're requiring of our partners. So for example, um, we are working, uh, looking at uh, our risk appetite statement. Like, so, so clearly, if we're giving Save the Children a $15 million award, there's certain requirements that they need to meet. But if we're giving a local organization a $500,000 award, it shouldn't probably be the same requirements. And so we're trying to figure out how do we um, provide, um, how do we give our staff the assurances that you need, we need to be accountable, we need to make sure we're making sure that everything's going the way it needs to go but we don't have to hold them. We don't have to have the same standards in terms of paperwork and information. I love what you're doing in terms of the back end work for local NGOs, because this has been my main concern and Samantha, uh, the administrator's concern as well. We do not want local organizations to build themselves up with the capacity that INGOs have with the whole HR system mm -hmm. and, and, and then become not who they are. Right. That's why we want to fund local organizations, because they are very well connected to the community. They're paying attention to the local community, not to say that INGOs are not, because they definitely are, but it differently. And so um, we've been working with philanthropy and others to think about um, organizations that are aligned in terms of our values and aligned in terms of the, the thing, the, the place we're trying to get who can do that back end work. Um, and so I think I just applaud you for doing that. And we are working with philanthropy to think about how we can do, I think someone said philanthropy can provide models, can show what works. Um, and we already have some of that happening um, with the Hewlett Foundation, the Skoll Foundation, I think Hilton, we're, we're gonna be working on that with them. So I think that's very, very important. Um, we are also, um, we realize also that in order for our projects to actually reach the goals that we say we want to be reaching and to be accountable to the goals and the outcomes that we're looking for, that we really do need to be doing co-goal creation with the communities that we're working in. We can't just come into a community and say, okay, so we wanna reduce your malaria rates, even if you don't care about your malaria rates, we need to talk to them and say, okay, if we're gonna work on malaria, what else do you want us to work on? How can we make that happen? And so we're trying to think more holistically about um, what we're doing. We're talking a lot to our US Congress about this um, because they have very specific goals and, and, and desires for us. And we're trying to explain how all these things are interrelated. Um, and then finally, we are also creating new funding models, new ways of uh, tracking progress um, that um, provide local organizations with some resources upfront to get started with us. And then we co-create those goals along the way um, to get to where we need to go. Um, if I could also just um, comment on something, which is um, as we talk about enabling environment, we've spent a lot of time on some, and Administrator Power started this very early in her time with USAID, trying to really set a tone and to be really clear with everybody that locally led development shouldn't be a side effort that we work on. It needs to be central to everything we're doing. Um, I was in the Obama administration. We started very um, siloed projects, which were really important, like local works and other things. And we have a new partners initiative. Those things are very important. Um, but I think we as donors, um, you know, we have um, 19 donors who've now signed bilateral donors who've signed on to the donor statement. Philanthropy did some amazing work yesterday announcing their donor statement. 
we've made it very clear that locally led development is not over there. It has to be central to what we're doing and be part of every effort that we're doing. We're actually changing some uh, processes internally to make missions tell us, if you're not working with a local partner on every project, tell us why not. Why did you make the choice? Don't make the assumption you work with an INGO, make the assumption you work with a local partner and make the case for why you couldn't work with a local partner. Because and at that point, then it forces missions to understand that. And the last thing I would say in terms of enabling environment is we are really working with our missions to think outside of Nairobi, for example, and to think about going out to other places. We have some very innovative things happening um, in countries like Nepal and other places where we um, we're working on allowing remote work for our foreign service nationals to work in other regions other than the capital um, every day so that they can start to get to know those communities better and then feed that back in and fund those organizations where they're living. So I'll stop there, but just say, I think enabling environment is something we all need to be working on. Thank you so much, Michelle. And great great to hear these very concrete examples. And uh, I think there's another one we, we know about because Wings is part of a consortium that is uh, uh, discussing with USAID on a, a program called Powered by the People. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not yet launched, but uh, <laughs> so I, I won't unveil, but I think it's, it's, it's commendable to see that there are lots of efforts to, to walk the talk on localization, including with unrestricted funding to local organizations, which I think is, is really very connected to the, to the question uh, we're, we're talking about. Um, Digan, um, now I'd like to ask you to give us some hope uh, and, to, <laughs> <laughs> and, to, and to share some you know, good examples, like best practices uh, uh, when you've seen you know, funders really acting as partners, as, as equal partners uh, to, to, uh, to organizations in, in emerging economies, Global South. Uh, what, what, what can you share with us that will encourage to, to follow their, their example? Um, I think, honestly, um, I would love to see philanthropy get to the position where they fund all their organizations, their partners, to get endowments. Um, to me, that is um, real success and a game changer in the space, because that means that you are really looking for to achieve real equality between you and your partners. and the power is in the purse string. And once your partner has their own money and can walk away from your money, that's when you've really changed power um, dynamics. So that's what I'd love to see happen. I don't know of too many examples of that happening other than maybe the McKinsey Scott gift where partners were allowed to do whatever they wanted with it. And Adesso used it to start our own endowment. Um, and I am actually kind of shocked to see that a lot of of the recipients have done not have not done that. Um, it's only a small number, and I think it's because we have been programmed into this mindset of thinking that this money is endless, and uh, if it finishes, we'll just keep fundraising. And I I was shocked. I was talking to a recipient from Sierra Leone, and I was telling him what we were doing, and he was blown away. I was like, Why aren't you doing that? And he was like, ah, we didn't think about that. We were thinking about paying our staff, getting uh, you know, equitable salaries and good benefits for our staff. I said, that can come later. Continue your starvation cycle for another few years. <laughs> <laughs> but get to the point where you are liberated, finally, and you don't have to be dependent and be a beggar. Uh, that's what we chose. We said, we'll, we'll deal with this. We've been dealing with it for 32 years. We can handle another five years until we develop our endowment. So I was actually kind of shocked by that. So, um, but other things I would say is, is that, you know, obviously the same old, same old trust-based philanthropy, trust your partners. They know what to do with their resources. Um, don't micromanage them. I would love to see reports that are even video. Partners being able to report in a video form on the ground in the communities, talking to community members about what they've done in their local language. And then you take the responsibility of translating that on your end and not forcing them to write a 10, 15 page report. Um, I would love to see proposals be done with, the RFPs be done with, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
I, I know, I know there's a need for it. I know that there's a, there is a rationale that happens to call, to do these call for proposals and RFPs, but um, it's an exclusionary process. You're just already supporting the organizations that have the sophisticated team to write a nice proposal, to check off your list, to turn their theory of change from the community into your theory of change and go through that gymnastics process of trying to conform to what you want. That's a very sophisticated INGO model. That's not what works in the communities. So um, I would love to see that be done with. So anyways, I have a long list, but let me stop. <laughs> Cool. Thank you, Vegan. Well, Peter, maybe I can simply invite you to just react to what what Vegan was sharing and uh, and how how you see this, uh, especially the, the unrestricted funding, this, this trust based philanthropy question uh, uh, with local organizations. Uh, what are the, the the challenges you're you're encountering? Because I know you're doing sort of that and you're working on it, but tell us a bit more about what you're doing and, and what challenges you're you're facing to to accelerate that that path to transformation. We, we might open up a, a, a tennis match between Diga and me on some <laughs> questions. Uh, you know, I, I, let me go off script a little bit sure. here and just I want to talk about the the question of sharing power because we use that phrase a whole lot, and I'd like to take it apart a little bit. First, a little humility for the room. You know, whether you are a, a funder or a regranter, the biggest sources of funding for all the things you're working on are households. Mm -hmm. And the second biggest source of funding is going to be national government. And then there'll be ODA, and then there'll be philanthropy, right? So it, we, are, we are small in this picture. We have power, uh, but we're in a big power field. And I think it's, uh, this is really interesting to, to talk about with Dagon, because if you conceive the field more broadly, you can use what power you have more effectively. Um, I think also just in terms of personality, you know, foundations are not unions, right? We are not, we're not skilled at wielding power, I would say. So when we say that we're gonna shift power, and we're going to share power, we're going to force power. Let's be careful. I mean, how good is our follow through on that? Mm -hmm. There's other words that can be as powerful. And I, I would think, uh, I think right relationship is really important. And it's at the heart of what we're talking about with Dagan. It's at the heart of what USA is trying to do. Setting yourself up as a good donor and, and realizing that you are helping something rather than being powerful and calling the shots, right? But I also energy, shift energy within the system and let resources flow in the way that they should, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, you know, use the power phrase as much as it gets you where you wanna get, but broaden that. And also when someone turns around and say, well, how you doing that? Mm -hmm. Have good answers. No, about, um, about some of the things that Dagon mentioned, here we are gonna have a little bit of, um, you know, a debate. Uh, if foundations, for example, were to endow every grantee that they have, obviously we'd give about a hundredth of what we're giving right now to all of our grantees. Now that's that's not terribly useful, and I don't think it would meet Dagon's uh, objective. If we endow, we need to channel significant resources into fewer organizations. That also opens up a question about whether foundations should exist in perpetuity or they should spend down quickly. You know, the implication, Degan, and, I, and I, one that I, I respect is that foundations could transfer their endowments to local organizations who would then play a similar role, either for themselves and their own sustainability or for their own local eco ecosystem. I think that's a really good discussion, but I, I would say that as the president of a foundation, right now, uh, my obligation for my board is to exist in perpetuity. And I have to balance that and the good we can do for future generations with good we could do right now. Similarly, on, um, on entirely trust-based, entirely unrestricted funding, really, really useful. And in a lot of cases, the way to go, right? Especially if you're trying to help ecosystems, capacity building, and really getting things going. I also, I've spent half my life in the fundraising side, you know, on the other side of the table. 
And I would never have expected a funder to just hand me a check for general operating support. Uh, that's that. I wouldn't have seen myself that way. I would say, I have goals that are like yours, and I have work that can be inspiring to you. I won't turn myself into a pretzel to get funding from you, but I see a powerful, and there's the word, uh, partnership between us and you. Uh, and I would be willing to uh, actually put out some conditions of my own and say, are you willing to fund this? I, for, that, for me, that's the crux. Who in the partnership is saying what the partnership should do? Now, if it's the funder, that's an issue. But I don't think it's unreasonable for the funder to say, tell us what you're going to do with this. Tell us why we should invest in you rather than in another. And then, and then go to town supporting them. Um, yeah, that's quite good. Well, the yeah. audience will tell us with applause. <laughs> but yes, I think that uh, it opens definitely a really uh, complex, deep debates, mm -hmm. as you said, about perpetuity. Uh, but yeah, transferring endowments of all uh, big international foundations to local actors is, uh, is probably the topic of our next localization debate at UNG uh, next year. And Benjamin, I say what gives me hope is Degan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Um, Sarah, so back to you on um, your, your, your funding practice. Like, how do you really make that happen? You said already 100% uh, to local organizations. Uh, um, you know, how do you see this debate around unrestricted funding? You have, of course, your rules as, as a governmental organization, but then how are you able to go as far as possible in, in really uh, shifting this power to, to local uh, CSOs and communities? Absolutely. And I'm uh, proud that we embody many of these practices just um, from the beginning. We don't have requests for proposals or set uh, specifications. We accept uh, proposals on an ongoing basis in a variety of different sectors and, and um, are very flexible in that way. And it is um, great to see the impact that comes out of that because it can be multidimensional. You take something like inclusive recycling, and we funded Avina in, in that effort. You know, if you were to come with a specific recycling strategy or a specific strategy to empower, you know, to create job creation for, for marginalized individuals, you maybe wouldn't have put the two together. But by by seeing an opportunity that said, hey, there are individuals who are going through the trash and, and, and doing this, and we can then start from there and scale up and create a, a employment opportunity and create a recycling opportunity from it. Those are the types of multidimensional innovations that I think when you're open and can respond to proposals, you really see that take fruit. We do have um, a number of criteria that help guide what we do. And, and one of that, um, one piece of that is community ownership, really making sure that there is that participation in the organizations. As you said, you know, so many of the resources are in the household level. And so again, part of our criteria is that communities are bringing their own resources to it. That's part of how we uh, um, can, can stretch the resources further. And so for every project that we invest in, communities on average give a dollar, for every dollar we invest communities uh, give a dollar and 25 cents on on average and so that mobilization and uh, indication of that buy-in uh, is really important um, the ability to be catalytic and responsive you know we work with grantees over time and um, are able to help them take advantage of new opportunities when they come by being flexible or take advantage of new challenges so we're not necessarily a humanitarian funder, but we've often seen that the institutions um, that we fund in communities are the ones that are there when disaster strikes or when COVID strikes. And so we're able to be flexible and, and uh, give them the ability to, to meet the needs of, of their communities in a holistic way. Um, I think the ecosystem piece and endowment, one of the pieces that I think we've really been effective in extending our reach is community foundations. So we are we have worked to help set up community foundations who can then be that permanent infrastructure to, to re-grant and, and build the ecosystem. And we've worked with WINGS and in, in doing some of that mapping. We have a network of community foundations throughout Mexico who are doing that work, bringing their own resources and expanding that to Argentina and Brazil. 
We've had a track record of working with corporate foundations in the region to help uh, them be more strategic and effective in their grassroots philanthropy. So as just one example, recently uh, the board and I were in the Dominican Republic and we had a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce where for every dollar they brought, we brought a dollar um, to, to go to, to local civil society. And going back many years after this partnership had ended, we were delighted to learn that many of the different corporations now were doing that within their own practices. And so again, looking for the different ways that we can be catalytic and, and bring other resources, both from the communities um, themselves, uh, as well as from local partners that they can, that we can help them connect to and, and, and tap into those resources. Great, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for, for sharing this. And it's interesting as, as we were talking about shifting power and you're uh, referring to your work in building community foundations in Latin America. The, the term was actually coined by the, the Global Fund for Community Foundations back in 2016. Or uh, So the, the whole shift of power movement is very connected to uh, this effort to build endowments locally and community foundations of different forms uh, across the across the globe. So thanks for for reconnecting the the dot on that, um, and and so let's uh, let's uh, get to you, Sean, for a last a last question, uh, which is uh, uh, you know the, the the question that traditional state and private sector uh, power sometimes towards citizen democracy, um, and so how does the Vienna Foundation do cross cross sectoral collaboration and and, and learning? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's okay. Um, I think probably giving an example is the best way to answer that question. Um, uh, one of the biggest changes that we've been a, a, response, a part of was in Chile with their um, renewable energy matrix. And our partners in Chile about 15 years ago were uh, organizing against a dam in the southern part of Chile. And the dam was being promoted by the government, by, by businesses, international businesses, local businesses, as the solution to the Chilean energy crisis. And our partners said, we want Avina to help us fight this dam. So we had a board meeting and we said, what do we do with this? And uh, we decided we can't be against this, but what can we be pro? Mm -hmm. And we decided what we can be a Pro is a dialogue about what is the energy future for Chile. And if the dam is the best solution within that dialogue, then okay, you know, we're not going to oppose it. But to promote the dam without having that dialogue first, um, that is what, what we're going to work against. And so we tried to be pro, and that involved getting the businesses that were behind the dam at the table with the, some of the groups that were against the dam, mm. which was very difficult. And not all of it, uh, not all of them showed up, which is fine because you need somebody in the street to sort of put the pressure to get everybody to the table. Um, out of that became, came a process of everybody defending a certain energy scenario for the future, some much more you know, traditional, some all green, but everybody had to use the same framework, the same data and come up with their proposal. And this became a national dialogue. It was on TV, presidential candidates had to position themselves around these different scenarios. Um, in the end, the, the government uh, decided, we're gonna go ahead with the dam. <laughs> but it was only for a brief moment because at that time, now the, the, the country had seen there's alternatives. There's other ways to solve this problem. They didn't buy anymore that this is the only way. Um, fast forward and so people that were involved in that process became, they created a ministry of, of energy in Chile, which didn't exist before. And people that were involved in that process became leaders of the government in the energy, this new ministry. And having seen the alternatives, they decided to make different choices about the energy matrix in Chile. I'm not going to say that that was responsible for what happened next, but now the uh, Chile has one of the most renewable energy matrices in Latin America, and they never built the dam. They realized they didn't have to. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating example. Uh, yeah, thanks.
uh, and, and also again like showing how this localization is not just about implementing projects but getting this voice of communities in terms of shaping policy uh, so that was a great example and, and way to 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 uh, close the loop so we're going to how, how long do we still have for our debates and discussions uh, may i ask <laughs> Okay, and we might extend five minutes or so. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, thank you. So we're going to open the, the floor. Uh, I just first want to give a round of applause to our panelists because it was... Fantastic. Really a fantastic conversation. Uh, now I'd like to invite Natalie Ross, who's the Vice President of the Council and Foundation and our partner for this event, to, to say a few words maybe of what you thought about this discussion and how you see this from the, the Council and Foundation's perspective, and then we'll, we'll invite all of you to also share your questions with our panelists or your remarks. Please, Natalie. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I thought it was a great discussion. Um, and I don't have much I need to add um, for our organization, except to say that um, I think one of the things that's really important, and I'd love to hear from the panel um, a little bit about, um, are, are two things. One, at the very beginning, we heard about the challenges um, with closing civic space and the, the, make, the difficulties of foreign funding and what happens when restrictions are placed. And when we think about locally led development and uh, US funders, international foundations kind of grant making locally, it's very difficult to do if your resources aren't legally allowed to enter the country and be received. And so I'm just curious kind of where there might be bright spots that we could highlight um, or, or challenge when you are facing those challenges, how you might work around them. Um, and then the other angle that I think is just important to keep in mind, um, and it really builds on what Peter was saying around the humility of philanthropy and its, its place in this ecosystem. Um, when we talk about trust-based philanthropy, it's almost always positioned as funders trusting their grantees more. Mm -hmm. um, and at the council, we talk a lot about if philanthropy is to be a trusted partner, it needs to earn trust from others, not just be in the place to give trust. And so I'm curious kind of if there are ways that you've seen foundations be more trustworthy mm -hmm. or donors and what they've done to earn that trust in their work on locally led development. Amazing. Thank you. That was, uh, I think, the some of the answer is in the question, but that <laughs> fantastic, uh, Natalie, questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we can take a round and then we'll we'll invite the, the panelists to, to respond. Uh, please uh, go ahead. And if you can just introduce yourself. Uh, so one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm John Coonrod with the Movement for Community-Led Development. And I have a very specific question about India because India has illegalized regranting and it's destroyed some amazing infrastructure among civil society in India. And, uh, you know, I was really touched by the um, special rapporteur's comments on this, but what can be done about this? I mean, the restrictions are just growing mm -hmm. and there doesn't seem to be, um, it, it, you know, it, and it's a, in bed with the whole shift to autocracy. And I'm just wondering where the leverage points, where, where can we catalyze a reversal of that trend? Thank you for a very, very important question. I have one question here and then another one at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brooks Reed. I'm with Charities Aid Foundation America. We um, you know, are in the business of vetting and approving charities and making grants. We approve 10 or 20 a day um, under expenditure responsibility. And something I'm interested in is the conversation around you know, making the application or you know, the proposal process less burdensome on grantees. Um, and, and I think that you know, we definitely support that. And I think, you know, in this room, it's fairly a consensus that the concept that we make the burden, the administrative burden on the grantees less is kind of a, a non-controversial statement. Um, but I think, you know, I'm interested in your opinions on or thoughts on when that that trend runs into, you know, statements and, and uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, commitments that you've made to certain things like values and and things like that. And if I can give a specific example to put this in context, we've definitely run into difficulties when donors of ours have asked us to ensure that grantees have child protection policies, which are fairly non-controversial as, as an idea, um, but many organizations will not have those and the inf or the infrastructure to enforce them, more importantly. Um, so it, it, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on the tension between no, knowing that we don't want to make them 
build an HR structure, for example, but then having values that require HR structures for enforcement. Thank you. Yes, there, uh, one lady at the back here. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh. Thanks very much. My name is Shipra Narangsuri. I'm with uh, the UN Human uh, Human. Uh, the Human Settlements Program, United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat. And I also lead a coalition, a UN system-wide coalition called Local 2030, which is uh, which engages about 16 UN entities with partners on the whole conversation around localization um, for the sustainable development goals. What I did not hear a lot in this in this conversation, which was very enlightening and very important, was um, the role of the UN system and the partnerships with, with philanthropies. Peter, you referred to it a little bit in, in, and you started talking about it, but didn't develop it. And what I didn't hear enough was the role of local and regional governments. And again, um, you know, several of you mentioned it, but, but not enough. Um, whilst I understand that the, the premise of localization is really to, to make sure that local communities and local, local uh, organizations receive adequate funding for the work they're doing, to be able to scale it up and scale it wide, you need to have the policy influence and, and you need to be able to facilitate evidence-based policy making. You need to be able to get a coalition of local stakeholders. Avina described that very well, uh, but local and regional governments have to be at the center of that equation. Uh, just like local communities, very often international organizations, IFIs, uh, perhaps also philanthropies, find it hard to give or make grants to local governments. They don't have their public financial management systems in place. They don't have transparency accountability checks, et cetera. How do we make that possible? And this is where the role of the UN system, the entities who have a footprint on the ground, UNICEF was mentioned, UNDP was mentioned, UN Habitat, and several others who have a footprint on the ground, who work with communities every day. We're not, we're not, we're not perfect, far from it. We're very bureaucratic indeed. But at the same time, we have that footprint and we have the ability to convene. And we, I would love to hear more on how we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just take one last very quick uh, remark or question here, and then we'll, we'll go for a final round because we want to make sure we have time also to hear Rose uh, with her closing remarks. Thanks so much. I'm Sasha Chenoff. I'm, I'm on the board of Need Global, and we're so pleased that our members are here and contributing to this discussion. I'm a CEO and founder of Refuge Point. We find solutions for refugees. And the headline of my question is just that. Now there are more than 110 million people forcibly displaced. Peter, as you know, Dagan, as you know, as, you, as many of us here know, that's about one in every 74 people in the world. Refugees are now part of the Sustainable Development Goals. When people flee across the border, they often don't go home for 20 years or longer. There are many refugee leaders who have founded refugee-led organizations in Kenya and around the world, which we are supporting and helping to energize a network. Hilton has been played an important role in that, and Avina has too in so many different ways. But the question is, how do we make sure that refugees are included in this agenda of localization? Well, thank you, thank you for all your great questions. We'd love to, to take more, but I think we already have a lot to to chew <laughs> and discuss. Um, maybe what we can do is just like, at the same time as uh, you address the question, we, we just do a last sort of quick round, if you can just stick to about a minute uh, or, or a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, well, I guess you, you took notes of the, of the, of the questions. We, we had questions on the shrinking space uh, and, and, and how it's possible to reverse that trend, uh, especially as we try to localize uh, at the same time, um, there was a question about the role of the UN and, and the role of local and regional governments. I think Peter will be uh, uh, addressing that one. There's a question about inclusion of refugees, another one about uh, burdensome reporting and, and, and uh, all the administrative uh, barriers to, to localization. Uh, so I, I let you pick your question and, and answer it, but we'll, we can just go with a, with a, you wanted to oh, start, Peter, Peter? Sit up. All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can take the last two questions, at least my point of view on them. Um, I'm not trying to duck the first three. Uh, uh, on, on the UN system, and I, I, I speak with affection and, uh, and respect, uh, and 
all of my, my wife worked for UNDP for 10 years and UNICEFology has been part of my job description for 30 years. But I don't think the UN has kept up with locally led development. Uh, and I think, I think the bilaterals are making significant changes in the way that they work, philanthropy as well, perhaps the MDBs. I think the UN system, which is the major channel for humanitarian funding, is still in the very low digits. And I think part of that is technical. I think a lot of it is political in that both the, the UN system and the INGOs want to maintain, well, for good reasons internally, want to maintain control because they feel they want to do quick turnaround on funding. But I think we have an, in Dagon's person in near in lots of civil society uh, networks, really good ways that the UN could engage more in that. And that the power of, of, of the UN organizations and the, the fact that they are everywhere could be mobilized. Said the same thing actually to the UNICEF director when I met with her the other day. Nobody but UNICEF knows so many organizations on the ground, but has to really be part of this movement. I think that's related to the, the refugee question that Sasha raised. Uh, you know, people tend to consider refugee and humanitarian uh, questions as different or harder or even unmanageable because people are on the move. They're not. They are the same, the, the same issues, uh, somewhat more complicated, but that we, we deal with in development. And Hilton, for example, has been funding refugee-led organizations in the same way that we fund locally-led organizations. And here, you know, I, I, I would also, uh, from my colleague at the UN, I, I totally agree with you about local government. And this is not something that philanthropy does very well. We ourselves are really, we've got our toes in the water, but we've made $3 million grants to the cities of Medellin, of Barranquilla, and, and, and of Addis, and are, trying, uh, are negotiating one for, for Kampala to learn about how we can fund local government. And I, I think primarily municipalities as where the rubber really meets the road for migrants. Uh, and it won't be easy, but it's greatly appreciated. We were at a mayor's migration council meeting the other day. They are just eager to have philanthropic partners and I think they will be very good ones. So maybe we can think about how we can work together on that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for your remarks. Um, well, since we're mixing, who, who wants to go next? <laughs> Maybe uh, Sarah? Sure. Um, I'll start with um, the forcibly displaced and, and refugees and migration. Uh, I think they are amongst the best. Um, the work that we do, uh, we work with over 40 organizations across 12 countries integrating migrants and refugees in their communities. And I think it's some of the most compelling data points for why localization and community-led work is so important. Because when you work through a community organization to integrate migrants and help the host community, it's more effective, it reduces xenophobia. It is just an example, again, of these global challenges. It really hits the, uh, it hits at the community level and, and, and addressing it at that level can be um, that much more effective. Um, on, on trust, uh, which I think was so important, absolutely, you know, our mantra um, at the Inter-American Foundation is they know how. And so we really try to bring that humility and trust to what we do, including to the other question in, in making our policies and approaches less burdensome. And so that's why we accept proposals in multiple languages from Haitian Creole to Portuguese to Spanish. It's why we, we have local staff meet and work with them. We do some of our monitoring for instance to take Haiti as an example over FaceTime uh, and really, um, and really, and really try to support that that flexibility. And I'm very proud that the data has borne that out. The Center for Effective Philanthropy does a survey every few years, and we've been rated the top one percent for openness to grantee ideas and strategies, and for the fact that our monitoring and auditing is helpful to them and, and a helpful part of the process. And when I've met with grantees, they've sometimes and asked them, "What's the difference that we make, or what do you most value?" They talk about the fact that. Oh, you know, through working with your auditors, I recognize that we as a community were bringing all of these resources. And now when we apply to other funders, we make sure that we account for all this investment that we ourselves are, are doing. And so we really see that as, as part of it. And for the vast majority of our grantees, we're the first US government or international donor that they um, are receiving funding for. And so then we help, help build uh, that capacity. 
And then I guess just the last uh, piece, oh, sorry. Okay, well, I'll just add on the policy and, and work with local regional government multilaterals, absolutely. I think it's an important part of the work we do is to not just provide the funding to the projects, but to lift up those voices and support mm -hmm. that engagement. And so increasingly in a lot of our grant making, we are including that kind of funding to have them play a role in those and be at the tables, as, as you said so effectively, we've brought our grantees or funded our grantees to, to be at the Summit of the Americas or all sorts of different international convenings and, and, and think that that's a real way that we can have influence. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, we, we have to keep the last remarks yeah. very short. Sorry. So we, we have time for the closing remarks and, and for a little bit of networking. Um, dig in, Michelle, Michelle? Or dig in? I'll be quick. I, um, I'm just, I'll respond to the protection issue. Um, I completely agree. That is a problem. And I will tell you that a lot of the international NGOs who have these policies of safeguarding and child protection, it just becomes a checkoff list kind of exercise. And it also become it's they do training for their staff. But these are all heavy resource intensive things that most locals don't have. And so what we're trying to do at core is help develop those policies for them and say, can you put it into your manual? So make it easy. There's no reason to have them hire a consultant. There's no difference between child protection policy A and B. It's the same thing. Why don't we have office in a box or policy in a box and help and distribute that all over? So we make things honestly far more expensive and complicated than it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you so again. Maybe I'll just quickly, I, I'll follow your example and just say a couple of things. One is I think closing civic, civil space, civic space is a really important issue. It's one we take very, very seriously. And it's actually a separate kind of line of work that we're looking at, which is as we push out our localization agenda, how do we not put local partners at risk? And I'll just say this, which is that our global goal of 25% is exactly that. It's a global goal. In the past, we would say 30% to local partners and then say every mission must do 30%. And this year, what we're saying with this initiative, what we're saying is it has to be adjusted to the local circumstances. And in some places, um, we will give 80% to local partners and some people are already at 60%. And in other places, we'll be at 2% just because of how it, we need to be sensitive to local context. And then I'll just close on the local governments issue. I think this is actually a really important issue. We don't do a lot of government to government assistance, but we are actually incorporated in, in incorporating this into our work. And in Kenya, there was a huge effort and it continues to try to do regional funding, uh, regional governments. It's not very successful and we're actually taking lessons learned from that. And I think I'll just close with that, which is to say all this work is ongoing and making sure we're learning from it so that we don't recreate the wheel down the road and um, is really important uh, in, in our work. We're not doing a good job of it, but I think this is an example of real good sharing and learn learning. Michelle. Take us home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to one say four, uh, one comment on four things. <laughs> on Good India, time. on India, uh, from our experience working in different countries in Latin America, government support to civil society is always going like this. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be patient and you have to find, the, have the flexibility to work within the environment as it's constantly changing. Um, I can give you many examples of that. Perhaps I can after the. Um, as far as refugees and migration, uh, that's a key area for Avina. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out that we tend to have in the States, this America focus of the migrants that were coming here. And what we're seeing much more of is migration within the region mm -hmm. um, in South America from Venezuela, for example. Um, or even within uh, Central America, for example, the returned migrants from the United States that are arriving in airports of, of Central America every day, they just drop them off at the airport. And what are they supposed to do? So there's a lot of migration issues that we need to look at within uh, that are outside this, the, the focus of the United States. Um, as far as the uh, UN, uh, our experience with the UN has been with the Green Climate Fund, and it took us like two years to get the, you know, approved to be the credential to be part of them. And it was a lot of hoops and a lot of bureaucracy. We had to have a team just to do that. Um, and it was worth it. It was worth it. And we're having a great experience with that. But most organizations cannot do that. Um, and it also creates this power dynamic 
because there's only one organization that has the credential and they sort of have all the power with all the local partners, mm -hmm. you know, and that's mandated. Mm -hmm. So we're like, look, we, we want, we have to do this with you, but we, we have to be the ones reporting to them because it's, it's, it's almost like a power structure that's part of the grant. And so you have to see ways that you can work with that. And finally, um, for these uh, barriers to entry, which are different policies that need to be required according to a different um, organizational standards. What we do is we make it part of the grant. We don't make it a barrier to entry. We say, okay, you, we will approve this grant even though you don't have this policy and we'll help you build that policy. We'll actually put that in the grant. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this last round of, of input from, from all of you. Uh, there are really a lot of ideas uh, to consider and to work on here, building the local infrastructure for philanthropy and for civil society, leveraging our influence and our voice, building community foundations. I mean, there are so many, I won't list all of them, uh, but I really want to thank again all of you for an incredible uh, panel. Uh, and to close us, I would like to invite uh, our the co-chair of the Enabling Environment working group of wings, which is another thing I think is important is that we build this global voice as well. There's the local infrastructure, but also globally, we need as a sector to come together and, and influence these policies and this environment. So uh, Rose is leading that work as, uh, as part of the wings network. And of course is the CEO of the Epic Foundation, uh, the Epic Africa, sorry, uh, soon come Epic Foundation when the transfer of endowments will take place. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, uh, and so thank you. Thank you all. Please, Rose, I think you, you yeah, you, you should, you should just go. You, I don't know, I can yes. stand. Yeah, or just, but just then, so we, we all see you well. Well, yeah, you, or you can take this one, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank you, everybody. I think this was such an exciting, important and interesting panel, because I feel like the debate is now going beyond why the conceptual stuff, you know, to actually how. And I think this is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, but I'm glad to see what I took away. One of the takeaways is that there's a lot that's happening on the ground. There's a lot that we can learn from. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. Maybe there are new labels like localization, but the substance actually has been happening in some places. And I think like the Inter-America Foundation gave really you know, good examples and so did you. So how do we move forward and continue to learn from what exists rather than invent the wheel? Obviously there's other stuff that needs, needs to be done. So I, I don't have much time, I think I have three minutes. So I can't, I wouldn't be able to do justice to like what everybody said. I think we all had what they said. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I wanted to actually do is maybe say what I didn't hear and, uh -huh. and perhaps where we also need to take the conversation. And, and for me, where part of where we need to take the conversation, this whole issue about infrastructure to support philanthropy and localization. So it's, I, I, I feel that the debate has very much, you know, focus, which it should, it's very important on money, who gets how much, where, um, but we're not talking about, you know, what is the infrastructure even to enable this to happen? And yes, you know, Degan and there's some other examples of people who are trying to provide pieces of that infrastructure, but it goes beyond, just enabling funders to find local organizations. They need, funders also need to understand the larger context within which these partners exist because you can be supporting a partner, but if tomorrow there is some political upheaval, I mean, all the work you've done is gone. So, so I think we need to think more broadly of these landscapes and context within which we are working. And so entities that are also providing that sort of knowledge uh, and that sort of data. So, so the ecosystem is huge. It's, it's a ton of organization. We're seeing an emergence. Uh, I know Africa best, that's where I live and what, that's where I come from. And there's an emerging infrastructure that's happening on the ground. So I would urge you know, support <laughs> for that. It's like we're building the vehicle as we're moving because we can't wait for the infrastructure before we localize. So, so keep doing that, the individual, looking at the individual organization, what can we do with that? But also long-term, how do we build a system, sort of the underlying system? And it's also the underlying system of the enabling environment in terms of the legal and regulatory systems. Um, the work that my organization does is uh, really trying to bring visibility and knowledge about the African civil society sector. And for us, it's, it's, it's more, it's going beyond being able to find this organization, is also being able to really have big data on, so that we can describe the sector. What do we do? 
And you know, there are governments that may be willing to support our sector, but oftentimes when they ask us, you know, what does your sector actually do? <laughs> and I can tell them what I do, but I can't describe, you know, I live in Senegal. I can't say to the Minister of Finance, who we are asking to give us tax exempt status. Actually, what's our collective contribution to the economy of Senegal? How many people do we employ? How much revenue do we generate? You know, so we dream of, you know, the role of data in being able to then say to the minister, listen, you know, we employ 10,000 people. If it wasn't for us, you know, 200,000 children in the northern part of Senegal wouldn't be accessing education. Then you can have a very different conversation they can take us seriously. So I think there's, there's work to be done on at, at that level. Um, I think the last one, I think just, if there's still one second, 30 minutes, 30 <laughs> seconds, is, 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 is also about meeting um, local organizations where they are and, and to sort of take off the lenses or, or the glasses of what it looks like elsewhere and trying to replicate, so it's not replacing an INGO with now a local organization that becomes, you know, in, in, in shape and size, and like an NG, INGO. It's meeting organizations where we, they are, and we know from our own experience and research that majority of organizations are actually very small. Um, in our data, we, our cutoff is like, you know, under $100,000, and we see like 50% a list of the ones that respond to, to our surveys, and some of those surveys are quite robust, um, uh, under $100,000. And somebody said, actually, you should even lower that to 50,000, because probably 70% you know, of that 50% are below $50,000. So when funders are localizing, but they are looking for unicorns that are doing you know, $2 million a year, Actually, there's a funder who came to us and said, oh, I'm looking to engage organizations in Burkina Faso in nutrition. Do you, can you, do you have any organization in your database that are doing at least $1 million? We wanted to be polite, so we said, oh, we'll look. <laughs> and <we'd, laughs> but actually, you're already excluding 95% of the organizations. So who are you going to localize with? So I think this calls for real imagination and creativity and kind of take off the glasses and look at, you know, what do we have and, and how can we scale impact rather than think of scaling organizations? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's thinking in different ways of how can you begin to, to connect? And so the role of networks mm -hmm. uh, and how can you organize these small organizations so that maybe they don't want to be big. They just want to work in their very local community, but they're doing something that can connect with another. So yeah, so that's, those are my, my remarks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we we'll, we'll just have a little bit of time for networking. Uh, <laughs> please enjoy yourselves and connect. And thanks again, Rose. And Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I,